Hey guys, a couple of weeks ago my wife and I went out to Atlanta, Georgia. It was really to visit some family and friends, but we made a camping trip out of it and brought the camper. And I logged the entire trip with my bank's iDash at one second intervals. So I've got some stuff that I'll probably dribble, dribble over in videos in the coming months or whatever. But today I thought we'd go through the cool down process for the engine turbo and talk about that a little bit. So let's go ahead and do that. Engine and turbocharger cool down. Well, let me preface this conversation by saying that I'm no turbocharger expert. Everything that I tell you today is based on my own personal experience over the years fooling with these things, and I've done some research on them also. I've reached out several times to Holset and RAM over the years trying to get some precise temperatures and more information on that, and it's always discouraging, and as you know, that really manifests itself every time we go to a dealer and start asking questions. Although, whole set, RAM, the rest of them will tell you, well, go talk to your dealer, and then you know the frustration of doing that. So I came up with my own set of guidelines, and I'll share them with you, and we'll discuss the uh, idle times that RAM puts forth in their owner's manual. Back before we had water-cooled turbines, and the word water-cooled turbine is kind of misleading because all turbines are oil-cooled whether it has a water jacket circulating around it or not, they're all oil cooled. The water is really there for when you shut down. And that sounds a little squirrely, but what happens is you've got something called thermosiphoning. And it's got to be piped that way and designed that way. And all, nearly all modern turbines that I know of are that way. Holset, Garrett, Borg Warner. That's really the purpose of the water being sur surrounding the oil and while you're running, the water circulating around your bearing is it's helping, and but it's not the primary coolant. The oil is really the coolant, is my point. On some vehicles, you can actually hear that thermal siphon, siphoning taking place if you hurry up and raise the hood and listen down there by your turbocharger. But I shut down fairly cool, so I don't think I hear anything when I'm shut down. And I listed a couple of things here that I'm not going to go through for fear of being too long-winded. But basically what I'm saying is watch these things before you shut down. You don't have to have a temperature gauge or EGT gauge. It's nice if you have one. Five minutes is good. We're going to talk about this a little bit more. Let me just say a couple of things about regeneration. You're, when your truck is in regen, and you're not going to have regens while you're on the interstate running hard or towing it it's rare that you have one if you have one it's usually when you're just leaving and you've had some soot build up running around town i haven't ever seen a regen all the way to colorado and back and all the way to atlanta back but i do have them when i'm running around town and now that i'm logging that i can watch that real close but your regens do not increase your turbine temperature significantly maybe 50 to 100, 100 degrees at idle. But this 1,100 degrees that you see that burns off your soot in your DPF filter is not started at your turbine. It started at that uh, diesel oxidation catalyst right in front of the filter or as part of the DPF filter, actually. And as I mentioned up in the notes there, when you put your truck in neutral or park, the regeneration stops and then it'll pick back up after you uh, get back on the road. So thanks to thermal siphoning we don't have to worry as much about idle as we used to before we had the water cooling. But when we're towing and we've got these high EGTs we do want to cool down. So as I mentioned my rule of thumb is 400 degrees that's not written somewhere as etched in stone. That is just my number that I use, and I've heard a lot of people use the same thing, 350 to 400. It's a good, I think it's a good number and equates pretty good to Ram's recommendation of five minutes. Let's look at this first one here. It's very close to the scenario that we saw in the beginning. It may be the exact stop, in fact, where we pulled into that rest area. 
alongside the trucks. It took one minute to come down all the way to zero mile per hour from uh, 65 miles per hour up here. And we are doing. We were at 811 EGTs at the time. That's behind the turbo. That probe is sitting right on the exhaust of the turbo, so it's a pretty good, accurate indication of the temperature coming out of your turbo. The ambient temperature was 91, and the coolant temperature was 198. And then by the time the idle was over, uh, it was down to 190. That's going to always be different based on a t ambient temperature outside. You know what the temperature is. Different things, how hard you've been pulling. A lot of different things is going to change all of that. But that's that's what I saw. So you can see that it was about five and a half minutes of idling to come down from 578 to uh, my 400. And you can see when you let off the throttle, it drops like a rock. And that's a good thing. This one may get you seasick, but it's it's really the same kind of thing. It's just that I've got the two different axes. I've got the miles per hour over here and then the EGTs over here just to kind of show the dramatic uh, drop in your temperatures as your speed and time comes down. So we were recording 67. The old man must have been hot-footing it there. We had 828, had about the same temperatures and ambient temperatures as the last one, coolant, what have you. But this one, you know, and this is probably more typical when you're getting off the freeway, you've got to come to a stop at a corner and turn and maneuver around before you get into the service station or whatever you're doing. And that's what's taking place here. So it's, it was actually four minutes before we came to a complete halt. And if you count that out, that's lasting, what is that, uh, 4.2 minutes. So you do get some cooling effect as you're kind of neandering around here working into your... Uh, shutdown spot in fact i deliberately try to drag ass just to keep the old lady off my butt sometimes she'll say why are you driving so slow and things like that and really what i'm doing is just kind of giving my engine and coolant and turbo and everything time to kind of cool down before we actually come to a stop in this one we didn't stop at all and that's an example of just a quick fuel stop and then get back up on the on ramp and hit it again uh, this 838, you can see we were a little bit higher. By the way, this was all in fifth gear. If you run sixth gear, you're going to see higher temperatures than that. But it took about just a couple of minutes to get down to where we were into the fueling station. And then, what, about six, seven minutes, maybe, idling the whole time. Never did get down to my 400 degrees. One thing I could say about this 204 here, when we pulled in, we were at 204. And if you don't have a gauge, I would recommend waiting until this comes down below 201, 200, kind of a normal uh, idling temperature, uh, the lower the better. But, you know, you may not be able to get to below 201 regardless of how long you idle depending on the, you know, conditions. But we just fueled up and took back off and there we were. So you can kind of get an idea what that looked like. So the bottom line is thermal siphoning is really covering our butts when it comes to uh, idling these turbines because even 400 degrees, if that got to the bearing, that would be destructive to the oil, even, even synthetic oil, but it doesn't. And that's the beauty of thermal siphoning and water-cooled turbines. So that's going to do it for this video, guys and gals. I hope you uh, got something out of this. And I appreciate you watching my videos, and until next time, adios.